Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the next lecture in on our series on gastrointestinal diseases. At the beginning, we had said that there are two types of diarrheas. Diarrheas which are inflammatory diarrheas and are usually resulting in blood and mucus in the stool and diarrheas which are toxigenic which result in watery diarrheas. This slide outlines the points under which the lecture will be covered. We will cover the clinical presentation of a case of cholera its differential diagnosis and laboratory diagnosis. We will also cover the pathogenesis of cholera and management of a patient of cholera, the epidemiology and prophylaxis of cholera and in brief about other diarrheogenic comma shaped bacilli will also be discussed. A 30 year old male presented to the outpatient of a government hospital with complaints of weakness, leg cramps and exhaustion. He gave a history of watery diarrhea 10 times since morning. He had only one vomiting. There was no history of fever, abdominal cramps or blood and mucus in stool. Patient is a resident of Mumbai and other six people from his neighboring area are affected with similar complaints. On examination, pulse was 120 per minute, blood pressure was 90 by 60 millimeters of mercury. Patient was moderately dehydrated, systemic examination showed no abnormality. Patient was admitted to the medicine ward, intravenous fluids were started an input-output chart was maintained. Considering his history, the differential diagnosis of non-inflammatory gastroenteritis includes Vibrio species, Protozoa, Giardia, Cryptosporidium and Cyclosporia being the commonest ones, Traveller's diarrhea by Enterotoxigenic E. coli, Viruses, Norovirus, Rotavirus, Adeno and Astroviruses. It could also be caused due to preformed toxins produced by Bacillus cereus and Staphylococcus aureus. Now with this background, we decided first to collect a sample from the patient. Stool sample was collected, the stool was watery. If a delay of more than 4 hours is expected, stool was, has to be collected in a transport medium like Venkatraman and Ramakrishnan medium which contains essentially salt and peptone water, Carrie Blair medium which is more universal and can be used for majority of the diarrheas. If the delay of less than 4 hours is expected, the stool can even be taken in an enrichment medium like alkaline peptone water which facilitates the growth of Vibrio cholera. In remote places, if the transport medium are not available, filter paper soaked in liquid stool and sealed in a plastic bag can be used. Never collect sample from the bedpan. A catheter can be put into the colon and sample collected via a catheter. In our case, since patient gave us a stool sample, we first had examined the stool sample. Stool has a rice water appearance liquid stool with flakes of mucus in it. The picture on the left shows the picture of the stool. It really is called rice water because it looks like when rice is washed, the water which is left after that looks just like this, this whitish color which is that is why the sample is known as rice water stools. On microscopic examination, no pus cells or RBCs were seen. Darting motility of organisms was seen which was inhibited by Vibrio cholera O1 antiserum. So, a provisional report was sent to the clinician suggesting so, organism suggestive of Vibrio cholera was seen. A smear was made from the stool sample and stained by a gram stain and a monochrome dilute carbofuxin stain. Short curved pink rods about 1.5 microns by 2 micron in size were seen. They gave a fish in stream appearance because they were present in long long joined to each other and in parallel rows. They were, again a, they were looked for hanging drop. They were seen to be actively motile with a single polar flagellum. The samples were plated on McConkie's medium and one selective medium. The two selective mediums which are commonly used are the GTTA or the Monsoor's medium which essentially consists of gelatin, triptychase, torocolate agar, the TCBS or the thiocyl sulphate, citrate, bile salt, bromothymol blue, sucrose agar. All plates were incubated at 37 degrees centigrade under aerobic conditions. 
Growth was enhanced in an alkaline medium at a pH of 8.2. The colonies on McConkie's medium were 2 to 3 millimeters in size and transparent, non lactose fermenters. So, this was a non lactose fermenter organism which was causing the diarrhea. The colonies on GTTA medium were very, very characteristic small translucent colonies with grayish black centers, 3 to 4 millimeters in size. The TCBS is the most commonly used selective medium for Vibrio cholera. Colonies are large yellow which become green on prolonged incubation. This was after 24 hours, so none of these colonies have yet become green. The colonies were then used for identification to confirm the identity of the in pathogen. Colonies from a conkey's medium, a smear was made from the colonies stained with the gram stain, again to confirm the morphology that they were comma shaped organisms. Oxidase test was done with this colony. It was oxidase test positive, it was string test positive and it was cholera red reaction positive. This is a picture of the oxidase test positive. A loop full of the growth was then taken and added to a drop of a drop of 0.5 percent sodium torocolate in saline. The loop was picked up from the drop and it formed a string. So, this is the string test positive, a picture of the string test. It also gives a cholera red reaction positive which essentially works on the principle that it produces indole and breaks down nitrates to nitrites and this combined reaction gives a, the cholera red reaction. A 24 hours peptone water culture was taken and a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid were added to it. A reddish pink precipitate was seen. The routine biochemical reactions what we called as the IMVIC reactions last time also were put up. The organism was indole positive, H2S negative, MR positive, citrate positive, urease negative, glucose was fermented with production of acid only, no gas, lactose was not fermented, mannitol was fermented, sucrose was fermented also with the production of acid and on the triple sugar iron agar it gave a A by A reaction that is it was acidic in the butt and in the slope. The biochemical reactions were suggestive of Vibrio cholera. So, to confirm a diagnosis of Vibrio cholera, a glutination was attempted with O1 antiseda. A suspension of the culture was taken and a drop of O1 antiseda added, there was agglutination. This suggested Vibrio group of organisms, specifically Vibrio cholera. Then, agglutination with Inaba specific antiseda and Ogawa specific antiseda was done. Agglutination with Inaba was seen. This is a picture showing agglutination on the left hand side. On the right hand side is a control sample which is showing no agglutination. This is showing no agglutination. This is just a sus uh, suspension with no antiseda added to it. This is a suspension with antiseda added to it and you can see the clumping. This suggests that the, the organism is Vibrio cholera. Now, after putting it in the classification of O1, you have to differentiate between the two biotypes that is Vibrio cholera LTOR and the classical biotype. Both of them agglutinate with O1 antiseda, for which a few set of tests were set up. The organism gave hemolysis with sheep RBCs, gave agglutination of chick RBCs, gave a VP reaction positive and was susceptible to Mukherjee phase 5. So, it was put into the L tower biotype. If it was a classical biotype, it would have shown a susceptibility to polymyxin B and a susceptibility to Mukherjee's phase 6. Since both these reactions were not observed, it was put into the category of LTOR biotype. So, a report was sent to the reward. The report said Vibrio cholera LTOR in ABA serotype cultured, sensitive to tetracycline, cone trimoxazole, gentamicin, and chloramphenicol. It was sent for phage typing to the National Institute of Cholera and Enteric Diseases, Kolkata. The Basu and Mukherjee phage typing was done. Phage type 4 was detected. A similar isolate was obtained from the six other residents of that area with diarrhea. The source was likely to be a water supply to the area which had got contaminated with Vibrio cholera. Management of the patient may was maintained on IV fluids which was continued to replace the lost fluids and electrolytes. Antibacterials were not started in this particular patient because he was only moderately dehydrated. Tetracyclines may be started at extremes of life or to prevent a carrier state in some patients. Classification of Vibrios on into its various biotypes and serotypes is done based on the Gardner and Venkatrama's classification. Vibrios are first typed with the common H antigen. If we get agglutination with the common H antigen or the presence of this H antigen is seen. So, in all cholera and cholera like Vibrios with a common H antigen are put into group A. Group B are unrelated to cholera Vibrios by biochemically antigenically different and they do not agglutinate with this common H antigen. Now, once it is coming to the group A, it is then further agglutination is attempted with O subgroup 1. 
if it agglutinates with O subgroup 1, it belongs to the Vibrio cholera type uh, Vibrio cholera group. If it does not, it belongs to what are called now as the non agglutinating Vibrios. So, they could be O2 to O139. They are again divided into certain subgroups that is 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 and still non agglutinating ones which have not been put into any subgroup. The O subgroup 1 Vibrios could be with the classical and the LTOR again divided into serotypes based on the antigens into Ogawa, Inaba and Hikojima. Both of them are have got Ogawa, Inaba and Hikojima serotypes and Ogawa has got the antigens AB, Inaba has got the antigens AC and Hikojima has got both of them ABC. Cholera is an acute diarrheal disease which are non-inflammatory toxin mediated diarrhea. Infection is through infected food and water, humans are the only host. So, no transmission to man occurs from any other host, only human beings who are carriers can contaminate the environment with Vibrio cholera and the next human being gets infected either through contaminated uh, vegetables, fruits or water. The cholera stool is characteristically a bicarbonate rich isotonic fluid, watery stools with flecks of mucus and sweetish odour are, are seen. Looking at the pathogenesis of the disease, Vibrio are first ingested either in food or water. The vibrios multiply in the intestinal epithelium and produce an enterotoxin cholerogen. Toxin is heat labile and production is governed by a filamentous phage which is integrated either into the chromosome or present as a plasmid. If it is present as a plasmid, it can be easily transmissible from one vibrio cholera to the other organism which could be non-pathogenic but once it acquires a plasmid, it becomes pathogenic because now starts producing the toxin. The toxin consists of an A unit which has two fragments A1 and A2 and a B unit which has five fragments. The total molecular weight of the toxin is 84,000. An addition factor helps the bacteria to adhere to the intestinal cells. Now, this is a picture showing the pathogenesis of Vibrio cholera. This is an intestinal cell. The cholera Vibrio are ingested into the intestinal tract and the Vibrio cholera produces this toxin. The toxin as I told you has an A1 and A2 part and five B parts. The B part is what helps the toxin adhere to the intestinal cells on the ganglioside receptor. So, the ganglioside receptor is present on the surface of the cell. The B part adheres to this ganglioside receptor. Then to the B part of the toxin, the A2 part integrates and it conducts the A1 th through the uh, ganglioside receptor into the cell. It travels along with the A1 part into the cell, but it has no role in pathogenesis. It is the A1 part of the toxin which present in the cell increases adenyl late cyclase activity resulting in an increase in cyclic AMP. Once the cyclic AMP increases within the cell, there is a release of sodium ions, chloride ions, bicarbonate ions and potassium ions into the intestinal lumen resulting in an outpouring of water into the lumen and diarrhea. So, this is the basic pathogenesis as it occurs just to revise there is an accumulation of cyclic AMP in the intestinal cells resulting in irreversible hypersecretion of electrolytes, sodium, potassium, bicarbonates and water. There is an outpouring of isotonic fluid, flakes of mucus and protein resulting in vomiting and diarrhea. Patient becomes dehydrated. This leads to metabolic acidosis, hypokalemia, shock and death. Epidemiology of the disease is important because it is a notifiable disease and all confirmed cases must be informed to the local health authorities because if there is a common source, the common source can be attended to to prevent the outbreak from becoming larger. The deltaic region of the Ganga and the Brahmaputra have been the source of six pandemics which have spread to the other parts of the world from 1817 to 1923. They have all been caused by the classical biotype. The seventh pandemic originated in Indonesia and was caused by the Eltor biotype. So, though it was first detected in Hajj pilgrims, the first pan the pandemic due to the Eltor vibrio started in Indonesia. It was less severe with less mortality than the classical biotype. In 1992, another vibrio emerged in Chennai and caused the eighth pandemic. This was the O139. The O139 is different from the other two vibrios because it is capsulated and is more likely to cause bacteremias. In 1994, the Eltor strain re returned. Infection with all these strains can occur as either sporadic cases, epidemics or pandemics. They persist in the saline waters of coastal areas and in estuaries where they live in close association with small crustaceans. To prevent 
an outbreak, general measures which are required are good water supply because water supply getting contaminated would lead to major outbreaks and environmental sanitation. Specifically, when you have pipes or water supply and pipes of sewage traveling with each other, if the pipes degenerate and there is a contamination of the water supply by the sewage, it causes a lot of outbreaks of Vibrio cholera. This happens often in the monsoon season. Profile access can also be given by specific vaccines. The killed vaccine was originally used. It is given subcutaneously or intramuscularly. Equal number of classical and LTOR Vibrios are present in the vaccine. 8000 million organisms per ml. Equal numbers of Inaba and Ogawa are also present. Protection for this vaccine, however, now seen to last for only 3 to 6 months. The oral vaccines which are now being introduced are two types. One is a killed oral whole cell vaccine with or without the B subunit of the cholera toxin. And a live oral vaccine with the classical LTOR and O139 strains with the toxin genes being deleted so that only the protective me mechanism of the body is facilitated. So that is the Vibrio cholera, worldwide implications, an outbreak of cholera in any area has to be notified even to the WHO. The other diarogenic Vibrios, which can, apart from the Vibrio cholera, can be the halophilic Vibrios. These halophilic Vibrios are not able to grow in the absence of sodium chloride. They are natural inhabitants of seawater because there is a lot of sodium chloride in seawater. So most of these halophilic Vibrios are commonly seen in seawater. The species of halophilic vibrios which can infect pan are vibrio parahemolyticus, vibrio algenolyticus, vibrio vulnificus. Gastroenteritis usually occurs after consumption of seafood such as crabs, prawns and shrimps. Let's first have a look at vibrio parahemolyticus. It is a gram-negative comma-shaped bacilli capsulated. It has peritricus flagella on solid medium and has a polar flagella on liquid medium. So it has a different shape on both the mediums. Only on liquid medium, it resembles the polar flagella or the Vibrio cholera. It has a tendency to be pleomorphic. So you can see all sizes in any smear. You might see very small Vibrio parameticus or you might see a little larger variety of it, the organism also. Now to grow it, it has to be grown under aerobic conditions. It is halophilic. It has to be grown in peptone water with 8% sodium chloride. It can be grown on McConkie's agar where it will produce the typical non-lactose fermenter colonies which we saw with Vibrio cholera. So it is difficult to distinguish it from uh, Vibrio cholera on McConkie's agar. On TCBS, however, the appearance is absolutely different. It causes green colored colonies like this right from the beginning. So unlike Vibrio cholera which initially produced yellow colored colonies and after prolonged incubation gave green colored colonies, the Vibrio parahemolyticus characteristically produces green colored colonies even after 24 hours of incubation. On blood agar, it gives beta hemolysis. Or identification of Vibrio parahemolyticus is by the oxidase, catalase and nitrate test, which are all positive. It is also indole positive, just like the Vibrio cholera. It ferments sugars with acid production, glucose and mannitol. It does not ferment lactose and sucrose. Typically, the strains which infect man are hemolytic. This, can be, this is known as a Kanagawa phenomena. And it can be done on Vagatsuma's blood agar. As you can see here, it has a high salt mannitol medium and there is a clear zone of hemolysis around the colonies. This only occurs with human pathogens. In environmental strains, this clear zone of beta hemolysis will not be seen. This particular phenomena is then referred to as the Kanagawa phenomena. Pathogenicity, it also causes diarrhea. So it is one of the diarogenic vibrios. It causes explosive diarrhea with abdominal cramps, nausea, vomiting and fever. So it's essentially an inflammatory diarrhea, unlike Vibrio cholera, which was only a toxigenic diarrhea. So the feces contains cellular exudate and often blood. In the stool of a patient of Vibrio cholera, we will never see either cellular exudates or blood. It can also present as food poisoning because it contaminates seafood and seawater. Other infections which can be caused apart from diarrhea are wound infections, ear and eye infections, and pneumonia. The next halophilic vibrio which is commonly seen is vibrio algenolyticus. This is even more halophilic than the vibrio parahemolyticus. Again, it is present in sea water and seafood. It grows best at 10% sodium chloride while parahemolyticus required 8%, this requires 10%. On TCBS agar, the algenolyticus gives yellow colored colonies, so it is a sucrose fermenter. On blood agar, it gives swarming colonies. It is an opportunistic pathogen and can cause ear and wound infections while sea bathing. So it is not a diarogenic vibrio 
I am just covering it here so that you can understand that there are some vibrios which do not cause diarrhea and which can cause infections at other sites. The third of them is the Vibrio vulnificus, which is also a halophilus vibrio. It is a lactose fermenter. So, this is the only vibrio which is a lactose fermenter right from the beginning. So, it is often referred to as an L plus vibrio. It is a non sucrose fermenter and essentially causes wound infections. So, people walking on the beach, if you have, you have small cracks on your fair feet, it can enter through these cracks and it causes cellulitis because the sea water gets into the wound which is contaminated with Vibrio vulnificus. It can eventually lead to septicemias and it can be obtained from raw oysters which penetrate the gut mucosa. However, there are no gastrointestinal manifestations and the Vibrio vulnificus also does not present as diarrhea ever. So, with that we have covered all the Vibrios in this particular class. The first Vibrio was the Vibrio cholera which was the diariogenic Vibrio which presented with watery stools and non-inflammatory diarrhea. There are two types of biotypes of it, the classical and the LTOR and both these biotypes had three serotypes that is the Inaba, Egawa and Hikojima. Then we looked at another Vibrio which was a halophilic Vibrio which also caused a inflammatory diarrhea that is the Vibrio parahemolyticus. So, these were the only Vibrios which caused diarrhea. Some halophilic Vibrios which do not cause diarrhea and cause infection at other side are the Vibrio algenolyticus and the Vibrio vulnificus. The photographs which have been used in this particular session today, references for the figures have been shown in these slides. So, they can be, uh, you can approach them whenever you are on the net and have a look at them. Then there is another diariogenic comma shaped organism which is not called a Vibrio. This diariogenic comma shaped organism which is not a Vibrio is the Campylobacter. So, everything which is comma shaped is not Vibrio. This particular organism is comma shaped but it does not belong to the genus Vibrio. Campylobacter are gram negative curved bacilli which are commonly associated with diarrhea and septicemia. The common species which cause infection in man are Campylobacter jejuni which is the commonest presentation of diarrheal diseases. Campylobacter coli and Campylobacter lyrae can also cause diarrheal diseases. So, the three organisms which can present as diarrheal diseases are Campylobacter jejuni, Campylobacter coli, Campylobacter lyrae out of which Campylobacter jejuni is the commonest one which causes diarrhea in man. Campylobacter fetus usually presents with extra intestinal lesions. Campylobacter sputorum and Campylobacter concessus presents with abscesses and often these abscesses are present in the periodontal region. So, it is, they are often cause periodontal infections. The normal habitat of the Campylobacter is the GIT of animals. So, this is the only curved bacteria which you can get from animals. It can be present in poultry, sheep, cattle and pets. It is adapted to survive in the gastrointestinal mucosal layer of the intestine. Source of infection is usually by eating raw or undercooked chicken, meat, unpasteurized milk and contaminated water. The most common source is usually are eating undercooked chicken. In US, it is more common cause of diarogenic diseases than salmonella. The morphology of the organism is a very attractive looking organism as you can see, very curvaceous. It is a small curved gram negative bacilli. 0.5 microns to 0.5 microns in size. So, it is very long, not very broad. It is comma or spiral shaped sometimes. It is motile with a single polar flagella which can be present sometimes at one end and sometimes at both ends. Growth occurs under micro aerophilic conditions. So, all the organisms we have seen so far have been aerobic, aerobic organisms. So, they prefer to grow in the presence of oxygen. Now, this particular organism prefers to have little less of oxygen it does not believe that too much of a good thing is good for you. So, it requires only 5 percent of oxygen. While normally in human, in the normal air we have about 23 percent oxygen. So, you have to decrease the oxygen content in the environment around the organism for it to grow. It requires about 10 percent carbon dioxide and the rest of it, it is replaced with an inert gas such as nitrogen. Pathogenic species also grow better at 42 degrees centigrade. It requires specialized medium to grow which usually contains some enriched factors. So, it grows on media which are the sclerose medium, the Campylobacter via blood agar and the Budzellers medium. Colonies of Campylobacter after they have grown for 48 hours are about 2 to 3 millimeters in size. The first picture that you see is a blood free charcoal based medium where you can see very tiny colonies on the surface of the medium. The second picture that you see is on Campylobacter blood agar where you can see no hemolysis a little irregular colonies can be seen on the face on the surface of the medium. The clinical features of Campylobacter again 
it is an inflammatory diarrhea there is no toxin which is directly involved it is not it does not present as a toxigenic diarrhea so it presents with fever abdominal pain and watery diarrhea the stool contains leukocytes and blood it may also sometimes present as pseudo appendicitis the disease is usually self limiting and does not require treatment pathogenesis of this disease again the campylobacter are taken in with food or water into the intestinal tract they colonize the mucous membranes of the ileum jejunum colon and rectum the ileum and jejunum are the more common sites the colon and rectum are not so common incubation period varies from 1 to 7 days it invades the cells of the small intestine and damages them thus affecting fluid absorption it can cause glandular degeneration and crypt abscesses there is no role of toxins at all in causation of diarrhea with campylobacter for the laboratory diagnosis of campylobacter infection stool samples are collected in carry by transport medium so that is the advantage of carry by transport medium okay, if you do not know the causative organism if you are suspecting either vibrio or campylobacter the sample can be collected in carry by and be useful for most organisms the macroscopic examination of the stool is done even in case of campylobacter diarrhea the stool is watery so it resembles the macroscopically at least the cholera of stool microscopic examination reveals under the dark ground bacteria with darting or tumbling motility the different factor is that here pustules and rbcs are seen which are not seen in the stool of a patient with cholera gram stain shows comma shaped gram negative bacilli stool sample is then plated from the transport medium onto plating medium and incubated at 42 degrees in 5% of oxygen colonies appear in 48 hours we have already seen the colonies earlier but just to reshow you they are non hemolytic gray and moist so identification is done by the following biochemical test oxidase positive catalase positive nitrate positive asacrolytic there is no growth on 3% sodium chloride h2s is positive now the only test which differentiate campylobacter jejuni from campylobacter coli is the hippurate hydrolysis test and it is positive for campylobacter coli and not campylobacter jejuni these are the references of the figures used in this particular presentation and they can be accessed on the net so thank you we have covered two types of diarrheas in this particular presentation vibrios which cause the toxigenic diarrhea and some vibrios which do not cause toxigenic diarrheas and cause inflammatory diarrheas and the campylobacter group of organism which causes inflammatory diarrheas also thank you